Hi, I'm Mickey. I introduced my grandfather, Alan Yeomans, to you in the clip Climate Change Terminated, The Problem in a Nutshell, and I mentioned many of his achievements, especially related to him and his father's key line system of agriculture, now taught in colleges and universities all around the world. My grandfather first conceived the concept of increasing the fertility of soil to solve global warming problems in papers and lectures starting over 20 years ago. He maintained that a 1.6 percentage point increase in the organic matter content in the world's soils humans manage would restore atmospheric carbon dioxide levels to normal. His paper, The Agricultural Solution to the Greenhouse Effect, was the paper that started the interest in soil carbon sequestration. Google that title. Good farmers might know how carbon dioxide gets into soil. Could you explain to us how it works? Well... The first thing to appreciate is that carbon dioxide is 27% carbon and humus, the stuff of rich soils, is nearly 60% carbon. So we manufacture rich soil. How do we do that? The grasslands of the world, the prairies, the steepies of Asia, they're not cleared rainforests, they're natural grasslands, some of the richest soils in the world. So how did they get so fertile? Well, for those who want more details, on creating humours, go to chapter 8 in my book, Priority 1, Together We Can Beat Global Warming. Google it. It's all there at my website. But actually, Mickey, it's really simple. We go to the basics. Then you and your friends will know it when they're peddling their disinformation. Soil, topsoil, is simply subsoil containing lots of humus and organic matter. So we make topsoil more fertile and we turn virgin, mineral-rich subsoil into topsoil. We convert the carbon in carbon dioxide in the air into carbon as humus and organic matter in the soil. That's what I call soil carbon sequestration. So how do we get this humus? Easy. Humus is produced by microbes and earthworms consuming dead plant material. And smart farmers can really accelerate that process. They nurture the beasties. That means plenty of moisture, plenty of air. They're aerobic. They breathe oxygen and plenty of dead plant material and a little warmth and space and preferably some animal manure as a supplement. And away they go. Over millennia, microbes and earthworms evolved a kind of symbiotic relationship with grazing animals. Healthy, fertile soil suits them both. But microbes don't much like surface litter. And dead leaves, oh, it gets too hot, it gets too cold, it gets windy. Suddenly everything dries out. It's a hard life and not popular. True, some have adapted. Underground, microbes do far better and their best food is small, discarded, fibrous plant roots. Dead ones. Can't eat live roots. Be self-defeating. A grass seed sprouts, grows a few roots, grows a few leaves, takes water from the soil and moistens the leaves so they absorb carbon dioxide. The leaf uses solar energy to convert the carbon dioxide and water into plant cells fibres and sugars. In a few months, there's a big grass plant. If it's an annual, the plant dies and small dead roots become available for quantity. But there's also a really cute thing about grasses. When a grazing animal bites off the leaves or the grass is mowed, the plant can't breathe. It immediately sheds unwanted roots, the microbes' natural food, and puts all its energy into growing more leaves, fast. And then it regrows new roots. Uh, it's a permanent cycle. Microbes and earthworm droppings become humus. Uh, admittedly not all, as some does end up as carbon dioxide, but a lot becomes humus, and the soil is suddenly more fertile. That's why the grasslands are so good. So... Animal grazing or even mowing is an important part of fertility creation. Exactly, exactly. And you'll notice that every natural grassland in the world is populated with some type of grazing animal. This is all why strip grazing or cell grazing works so well. 
It is just fine tuning an absolutely natural process, a process that produces two crops simultaneously. One is grass to fatten cattle, the second is dead root fibres to feed microbes and earthworms. The farmer's extra bonus is richer soil. The whole planet's bonus is our farmers are sequestering atmospheric carbon dioxide into soil humus. What helps, speeds up the process, is to loosen the ground with a chisel plough or subsoiler plough. Nature can do that, but not fast enough. Like a dead tree has to fall over. Turning the soil upside down is wrong. It's too violent a change to the soil environment. And the turning ploughs have been doing that since the Middle Ages. They were invented just to kill weeds. In building soil fertility, agricultural chemicals are an absolute, absolute no-no. They kill the microbes and earthworms that do all the work. They also break down humus. Then the sick, bloated crops need pesticides. A few years and there's no humus left. And worse, the humus was converted into atmospheric carbon dioxide. OK, but we can't live on range-fed beef. What about vegetables and grains? That's easy. Farmers just change to more organic-type farming, like crop rotation, using animal manures and organic fertilisers, and also reincorporate livestock. And their soil humus levels will constantly climb. Grasses are just faster. And forests are just useless in sequestering carbon dioxide into soil. Trees don't shed roots, they just get bigger. So no food for our soil life. Worse, when the tree dies, soil can't eat the big roots. Termites eat dead trees and they produce methane. It's a dreadful, a dreadful greenhouse gas. So sure, grow trees for fruit or wood, but that's it. Boral forest soils are very poor. Rainforest soils are just atrocious. It's what you'd expect. So how do we make all that happen? How can we change farmers? Easy. We just do two things. We make the use of chemical fertilisers, herbicides and pesticides a non-tax deductible expense. And second, we make increases in soil carbon a prerequisite for any government-backed farm subsidies or assistance. Chemical companies hate the thought. So they say soil carbon testing is too difficult. Needs research. Rubbish. Just delaying tactics. It's easy and it's cheap. With a farm post hole digger, go down, say, half a metre. Collect the soil, a couple of locations in each paddock, screen out fibres, blend the samples and do just a carbon content only test. Next year, same thing, but go to random directions and random distances from previous holes. Then reward on average carbon increases. Who cares how they were achieved? Think about it. It's all self-correcting. Well, it sounds easy, but there's always a downside. Are there any? For agricultural chemical factories, for sure. So they'll lobby and connive and bribe. For the rest of us, I can't see any. Food isn't laced with chemicals, productivity is at least as good, costs are similar, and they progressively decline. And the nation is accepting its past responsibility for creating global warming, and it's correcting those past mistakes. And we end climate change. Great. But you always tell me my ongoing future is hopeless without nuclear energy and biofuels. So we all want to know, are they really that safe and practical? Because it's not what we're constantly hearing. I know, Mickey. They have lots of money to brainwash you and your friends. So following clips, we'll try to blow away some of their public relations smoke. Thank you. See you next time. Hope we helped. Bye.